If you don't mind standing out for the reading of the word. Reading from Mark uh, chapter 2. It says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such a large number that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowering the mat that the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority over the earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear God, thank you so much for this morning. We're so thankful for your word, the way you speak to us. We ask you this morning that you be with us, speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, Amen. Amen, you guys. Good morning. Now maybe see you guys. How's everybody doing? We, we made it to February already. It's, uh, it's Black History Month. Crazy how we're already here. Uh, one month is done. How you feel so far with the year? Anybody? So, yeah, so-so, okay. Yeah. Just checking in how the year's going so far. Uh, well, we're glad you're here. Um, also, uh, in February, always comes around, is our anniversary for our church, of New Life Church. Not our campus here, but our big church. As you guys know, we are a church with many different rooms. We got 17 campuses all over the state. And uh, 23 years ago, you can see some pictures in the back, is when uh, Pastor Rick moved to Arkansas, said yes to what God's calling him to do, and planted his church. And ever since then, it's been amazing to see the journey. And I will say this, I tell this to anybody, even with Pastor Rick, but also with our pastor in New York, it's amazing when one person says yes to what's gone to do, called them to do, what can happen. And the same goes for you guys. If you say yes to what God's calling you to do, you'll be amazed to see how many people can be impacted and how far the gospel can spread through you. So that's some crazy pictures right there. All right. A lot of old school stuff in the pictures. There you go. All right. I like it. All right. Well, if you missed last week, guys, um, we, uh, we had Pastor Bronson and Callie up here. They actually announced their church that they're going on a sabbatical for the month of February. So if you missed last week, they're up here. They're excited. They're, they're grateful for the time to get to go away, pray with God, to seek what he's doing, to be really refreshed, but also get some rest. So just know that uh, you might not see them around for the months of February, but he'll be back with us here on March 3rd, right back here with us at church. Um, So just be praying for them as you think of them, and as you go about your life, it'll be good to kind of have them in your minds as well. Now, for those who didn't come here last week, we actually started our Book of Mark series. Okay, you already have up there. Book of Mark series, we're going to do this all the way until Easter. And uh, we created a resource for you guys where you can scan the QR code right here and it'll get you two options. You can either buy a hard copy on Amazon for a couple of bucks, I think, or you can just download the free version. And all that is, it's a journal guide as we go through Mark. It has a reading plan, but also reflective questions for you, um, things you can ponder on, answer questions, take notes as we dig deep in as well. And uh, uh, so if if it's something that you want to do, just scan the QR code and get that going. It'll be great and very helpful for you. But um, before we start, I want to pray one more time real quick for our pastors as they're out uh, on sabbatical, but also I want to make sure we bless this time together. So dear God, thank you so much for this time. We're so thankful for New Life Church's anniversary of 23 years of faithfulness, and we ask that you help us to be faithful as well. Right now, I pray for Bronson and Callie as they're out resting up and they're praying after the, the things of what you have for them, that you bless them, that you be with them, that you give them rest and refresh them. We ask for this morning that you highlight to us what you want us to know. And we're so thankful we get to gather together like this. Amen. 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 Well, guys, um, as you guys know, I'm a foreigner. I need some help again with a word, okay? I know I always come up with phrases up here, and I don't really know what they mean sometimes. But so the other day, I was like doing some deep dive in some topic, and I didn't know if it was called a rabbit chase or a goose chase or like a rabbit. What's the right saying there? Rabbit Rabbit trail? 
I'm on a rabbit trail. Wild goose chase? Okay, yeah, that's, I think that's the one I was thinking of. Okay, so here I was on this wild goose chase, okay? Uh, let me tell you what happened. So somebody brought up to me that Aldi's is coming to town. Who knows what Aldi's is? Anybody? All right, so this is a German supermarket coming to town, West Little Rock. So I was excited. Yeah, of course. I know. I, now you know. Uh, Aldi's is coming to town. Now, from there, obviously, we went to the reality that Aldi's and Trader Joe's is the same company. Did you know that? No, now you know that. Okay. Then I, I talked about Aldi's. They have a Deutsche Küche. Can you all say Deutsche Küche? Deutsche Küche? Half of y'all not doing it. What are y'all doing? You gotta say it. You gotta learn Deutsche Küche. All right. So that's German kitchen. So they have some German products there. They have some and an amazing uh, German sausage. It's like a Bavarian sausage. Okay. Now from there, I went to a blog and then I signed up for another blog of a guy who lives in America now that makes authentic German bratwurst. Okay. So obviously, hours after watching all his YouTube videos and signing up for like some free <laughs> package of sausages, I was halfway, I was halfway convinced I needed a commercial grade meat grinder. And uh, I already invited the guys from work over when I, you know, have my final product, like we're gonna have it, enjoy it. And then I snapped out of it, okay? <laughs> so, but can you guys relate to that sometimes? So on, your, on your phone, you just get off on like one YouTube video and then, oh, this is interesting. And you end up at the wildest places. For me, it's most of the time something about German, honestly. But it is true that sometimes we find ourselves in those situations. A place where we got so curious about something that we just kept looking and wanting to learn more and more about it. Now, this Jamaican teacher puts it this way. When you're curious, I'll show this, the quote real quick for Moji. When you are curious, you learn. Okay, so that's what I did. I, I was curious, I learned how to do it, how to do the things, whatever. But then the next phase is when you are desperate, you discover. When you're curious, you learn, but when you're desperate, you discover. So today we will see how a little town wasn't just curious about Jesus, but how they were desperate to see the King of Kings. We will see that uh, the, in a little town discovered in the beginning of the kingdom of God was breaking into this world right in front of their eyes, and we had people that were either curious or they turned desperate to get in front of him. Now, the thesis for today that we're going to work off is our desperation drives us to Jesus. But Jesus' deliverance goes far deeper than what we can imagine. The sermon title is pretty straightforward, guys. It's the paralyzed man. That's all. That's, that's, that's it. That's what we're going to talk about. So we're going to stick to the text today, um, but we're going to keep it close. But I want you to kind of as we go through it, I want you to always remember the, the difference between curiosity and desperation and what it leads to. Point one, I mean, we're going to be in Mark 2, verses 1 to 4 to start off with. We just read it. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached a word, of, word to them. Some man came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. Now, can you show point one for us? As if you're taking notes, point one, when we are desperate, we do anything to, to encounter Jesus. I'm going to read it one more time just to get it really, really right this time. When we're desperate, we do anything to encounter Jesus. Now, Mark, the author of this book, he worked both with Paul and with Peter. So he was close with Peter, who was an eyewitness to Jesus. So he, he downloaded all of his stories to Mark. He heard all the stories from Jesus directly from the eyewitness. And then with Paul, he had access to Paul, who was probably the biggest and craziest leader of the earliest, uh, early church movement. And he saw some amazing things uh, done through Jesus, right? Now, together with this loaded knowledge, he composes the gospel of Mark. That's what we're reading. Now, to catch us up of where we're at in this text, because we're only in, in chapter 2, but a lot of things already happened, right? So thus far, Jesus had already got baptized. He started his ministry. He, uh, he was tempted in the wilderness already. He, in Mark specifically, he already called four disciples to follow after him. He healed a man with an unclean spirit. Then there's one paragraph in Mark 1 that says, uh, Jesus heals many. So he heals a lot of people. And then we, he, we see a story of Jesus um, healing the man with unclean spirit. And then Jesus does his first preaching tour around the neighbor, neighboring cities. So he, he says he's going with the neighboring towns, preaching the word of God, talking about the kingdom of God's coming and is near, but also healing people. And then what we pick back up is he came back home. 
home to Capernaum. And this is a lot of uh, scholars do believe that this was actually his hometown where he grew up and was, spent a lot of time there, so people knew him. Now, this moment when he returned back home from this first little preaching tour for a couple of days, it must have, it must have sparked peak curiosity in all those who lived in first century Galilee. Because the words started to travel about this new teacher, this new rabbi, and there's some healing going on, and all this stuff was being talked about. Now, the one person that also lived during the time is who we know as the paralytic, the man that was paralyzed, the story about today, who was probably known around town because he's been sick for years. And he was probably posted up by the gates of the city, as culture would have it, because he was unclean. So every day, people would walk in the city, they would pass him, and when they would leave, they would pass him, and there would just be a lot of traffic, right? And everybody knew him, a lot of people knew him, and uh, uh, were close to him. Now, this whole time when Jesus on his first preaching tour, travelers would come in, in and out. Bronson talked about last week how this wasn't just like a small little town. This is a pretty busy, heavy traffic area, a lot of trading, a lot of good lo uh, geographical location for trades and all this stuff. So there must have been a lot of chatter going on. And I can only imagine that the guy on the gates was sitting there hearing all these stories. Like, hey, did you hear about Jesus healing these, all these people? Did you hear about Jesus getting baptized by John? Did you hear about Jesus being tempted in the desert and all these stories? And did you hear what he said? Did you see how he's preaching? And he, curiosity rose up in him. Now, we don't really know the full scope of, how, how, of who started the effort to get this man in front of Jesus. But four guys ended up starting to carry him to the house where Jesus is at. So four guys and him, they carry him. We don't really know if it's just the four guys that have the faith. Some scholars actually believe that the man himself had the faith. And he gathered the guys together. And it was a collective effort of their faith. We'll see that later as well. So they get him up, and they knew they had to get him to Jesus. Now, when they walked up, it was too packed. They walked up, and the house was already filled. There was no standing room. They couldn't get to Jesus. So they assessed the situation and came to the tipping point where their curiosity stopped and their desperation took over. Again, the curiosity brings you to learning. Oh, I want to learn about this guy. I want to see what he's all about. But then they switched from that to, I got to get in front of Jesus. And this group was like, no, 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 no. This is happening. We're going to get you in front of Jesus. This is happening today. And they started getting desperate. They were desperate to encounter Jesus and were willing to do anything to get it to him. Anything they were willing to do because they were desperate to get him in front of Jesus. Have you ever been so desperate for something? Just think about your life for a second. When I was thinking about it, the first thing that came to mind was one time we were traveling. Uh, we were doing like some kayaking, backpacking, camping situation through some little islands. Sounds kind of complicated, but it was fun. But basically, we packed up a bunch of stuff. We kayaked into the, into the ocean and like we went to some island. And that the first night when we made camp, we realized we've forgotten all of our carbs. So all of the noodles, rice, bread, none of that. Everything was done here. We all left it in our cars. But we had some meat and some stuff. So we rationed everything out. And obviously, that made for some light days. So I think on day four, it was our last day, we were starving. We were hungry. And one of our leaders made the last batch of eggs that we had. Like, this is the weird, like, you know, when, you, when you're desperate, you make, like, eggs with, I don't know, ramen noodles and all this. Whatever you have, you punch it all together, right? So we had that situation going, and it's almost finished, and then our leader drops everything on the floor, all over the muddy island, like, mud floor, between rocks and little plants and all this stuff. So we looked at each other, and obviously we started eating right off the, off the ground, because we're desperate. <laughs> we were starving. We were desperate for food. So we started eating the food off the, off the ground. But how desperate, if we're honest, are we to encounter Jesus? How desperate are we to encounter him? If there's an obstacle stopping us, are we willing to do anything just to get to him? If us, maybe our schedule is stopping us. Maybe our church upbringing is stopping us to get to him. I don't know what it is for you, but are we, are we stopping it or are we desperate enough to get to him? Now, these five knew that Jesus could make the difference. They had faith that Jesus could heal him, and they did whatever it took. Now, if you're honest with yourself, and you assess that situation of, are you desperate enough to get in front of Jesus? Maybe if you look at your life, and you look at what, what needs really help, what is stopping you to get help? Maybe your marriage, if you're looking at it, and it's like, hey, we're not heading in the right direction. Are you, are you desperate enough to fix it? Are you desperate enough to get in front of Jesus and say, hey, I need this fixed. I need to do the work. I want to show up. I want to get an encounter with you and bring this problem to you. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your health. Are we desperate enough to encounter Jesus that we might even bring our Bible to work 
and a reader because that's the only time we can get? Or are we desperate enough to show up on Sundays even though we have other plans or I don't know, want to do something fun or whatever it might be? I don't, obviously, you can miss a Sunday. That's not, that's not it. But are we desperate in our heart to make room in our schedules, make room in our relationships to get in front of him? We have to be desperate to encounter Jesus like these guys in the story. They knew if it was all true, and again, at this point, they didn't know yet. It was still a desperation for it. They knew that if it all was true, that one encounter with the Son of God could change his life. And they were right, but it did come differently than what they expect. Point two, Jesus will heal us far deeper than even our deepest desires and desperations. Um, at this point, we're going to be in Mark 2, the fifth verse, and then we're going to do a little bit of, we're going to chop it up a little bit. Uh, we're going to jump ahead a little bit, and then at our third point, we'll come right back to the middle part that we're going to leave out for a second. But uh, Mark 2, verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, again, in, in this, it doesn't specify just the four guys' faith, it just talks about their faith. It could be the, even the people in the room. Maybe there's people that believe for that too, for him to get healing. So their faith, our faith can move mountains, guys. But when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now talk about misreading a room, right? You have a whole town that just had heard for, for weeks or days that Jesus can heal people. And they're like, oh man, we, gotta, we got our guy. We know our guy from the gate. We're going to bring him in front of him. And he's going to heal him. It's going to be amazing. We all get to see it. And then Jesus is like, your sins are forgiven. That's not what we're here for, right? Come on. Mark 2.10, and this is, again, he's going to argue with some teachers in a second. We're going to get to this in a second. But then he goes back, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. So again, what, is, what just happened? So he gets in front of him. He gets his sins forgiven. He doesn't really want that at first, right? But then he gets his sins forgiven, but he also gets healed as well, and he walks out. Now, Jesus met him where he was at, and he resolved his desire to walk again. But he didn't stop there. He went deeper. He didn't just do what the man desired, but he went deeper to the real issue, the real problem. He's looking past the circumstances, the outside appearance, and zeroes in on his true need to be reconciled with God, to have a relationship with God. That's the most important thing for him. He focuses on forgiving his, of sins and eternal salvation. He offers a relationship to walk alongside. So when the storms come again, because the storms will always come, that we have something to walk alongside with. But this passage highlights an interesting connection between sins and sickness in the cultural context back then. So here's what uh, William Elaine says. It is intelligible, however, against the background provided by the Old Testament where sin and disease and forgiveness and healing are frequently interrelated concepts. Healing is conditioned by the forgiveness of God and it's often the demonstration of that forgiveness. So the cultural understanding is that when you had sinned, you had to be cleaned. And you had to actually leave the city, out the gate, you had to leave the city because you were unclean, get right with God, get healed, and then you could come back. So even this, uh, I think yesterday morning I read, uh, I'm in Samuel right now, about David supposed to have dinner with Saul, and he doesn't show up, and Saul was like, ah, he's probably unclean, he'll be back tomorrow. But then the second day when he doesn't show up, he gets nervous, and then there's a whole different story there. But it was common for people to know, if you didn't show up for dinner, like we have to make dinner plans, and you didn't show up, it's like, oh, okay, they probably ran into some issue, they had to get cleaned out the city real quick, maybe they'll be back tomorrow. And there'd be routines, like if it's like, oh, you got to do this and this and this, three days to get back clean, and you can come back in the city. So there's a big connection between, between sin and like uncleanliness. Now for those who are suffering from long-term sicknesses, they were shunned from the community. They're deemed as sinners so bad that they could never go back in the city. That's why they're at the gate, because they couldn't go back in. They couldn't be because they were sinned so bad. And they were unclean people. So in this case, when he healed him, it was actually a demonstration of forgiveness. So he could go back in the city. He could go back in because he was publicly forgiven of his sins by him being healed. Jesus went deeper than everybody thought. Because he didn't just heal him. He forgave his sins. Now, what in your life needs a deeper look? If you had to do a kind of report, run a report in your life, and kind of bring back the findings of, hey, here's my big, big issues, here's my big problems, here's what's going on, just like this man, he, hey, I need to get healed, that's my real problem. 
But if we want to go deeper, is that really the biggest problem you have? Or is the bigger problem to have forgiveness of your sins and go back in a relationship with Jesus? And then from there, your problems, you can walk them out with Jesus by your side. And our problems might don't, not even that big anymore. Our financial problems, our, our life anxiety that we have about things. If we are in a relationship with Jesus and he forgave you your sins and you're back part of the family, you're a son and a daughter of God, the problems will fade away. And not that, not that the problems might fade away, but you can master them. You can walk through them. You have him by your side and you know in the end he will win. So maybe now when you're dreading going to work because you can't stand your boss or your coworkers, or I don't know, they hate you, they hate, uh, you hate them, they hate you kind of situation. I don't know what it is, right? But in those situations, can you go deeper? Maybe you go in and you start getting compassion for them and seeing them as what the real problem is, that they're far from God, and you can be praying for them. You can be an example for them of how you can bring healing and forgiveness into your workplace. Today, y'all won't get to see it unless you come back for second service. We have another M18 graduation. And you've seen before, if, if you only come to first service, you should come to second service sometimes because you have some MIT graduation. It's pretty awesome, right? But it's doing wonderful work. But what I love about Blake and Ashley is that they know they don't, they don't want just people to get off of drugs or not drink anymore or get sober. They know that the issue is deeper than that. They, they know that we, there are so many facilities that can get you help or rehabs and all this stuff. But they know if we can bring them in front of Jesus and address the deeper issue of them becoming uh, their sins forgiven to live with Christ and be in a relationship with him, they know it can be a long-lasting change, not just a change for three weeks, a month, or a year. And he can do the same for you. He wants to heal your addictions. He wants to get right with you. He wants you to come home and be part of the family. He wants to go deeper with you as well. You see, we, we think a lot of times we need to do all this stuff to get in front of Jesus and God, right? We have to do all the things first and then we come to him. But this text shows us that all we need is Jesus. All we need is him. And he will always go deeper, but it starts with him. Forgiveness of your sins and he will work with you. He will walk alongside you. Kind of like what Fitz was talking about with um, um, the test taking him over and over. He will be with you every step of the way. Every test, will, he will be with you by, by your side and help you get through it. Now, if we go back to our text today, we could think that everybody must have just loved that, right? Because the, that was pretty cool when he, get, when he gets healed. He did an amazing job, healing and forgiveness, all that good stuff. But there was people in the room that had some serious problems with that, right? We know the teachers, that we're about to talk about them in a second. But because the biggest problem for them was because in order for, them, for him to forgive the sins like that, you'd have to be God. The religious leaders did not like that. And let's see how that all plays out. Point three. Jesus does not take the easy road for you and me. I'll leave that there for a second. Jesus does not take the easy road for you and me. We're going to be picking up in Mark 2, 5 to 9, and we're going to end in the very last uh, piece of this text today. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to them, said to the paralyzed man, your son, your sins are forgiven. We read that already. 9 and 6. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, hold up, wait a minute, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. And I, like, I actually really like how the Bible says it. Why does this fellow talk like that? <laughs> Who's, who, who talks like that? What does this fellow think he is? Who, who do you think he is talking like this out here, right? So he's, he, they're like in their hearts, they're like, nah, nah, he's going too far now, right? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what, what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk. And then our last one, we'll get to this in the very end, is this, um, this is in verse 12. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. But let's go back to the moment where they, they're sitting there, they're, they're asking these questions about Jesus, and then Jesus just addresses them right in front of everybody, Right? Everybody's ready in the room. They're excited to see the healing powers firsthand. Jesus starts to say stuff like he's God, and everybody quiets down. Because back then, nobody did that. You did not talk like that, right? Because everybody knew the religious law leaders, they were very clear that only God can forgive sins. The high priest was the closest to that process. You had to go to the temple to bring your sacrifices. There's a whole structure. All their lives, 
was centered around the, 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 of this idea that there is no God besides God. So if somebody comes in and says, hey, hey, new system alert. I got a new way for you guys. I'll just forgive your sins. That's actually a good thing that they would raise some questions, right? Like, hold up. We don't want to have that same thing happen to us either. When somebody walks in now and says, hey, I'm the new Jesus. What's up? So they have a good point. They have a good point. Now, Jesus is entering into this conflict knowing that this will be the road he has to take. So the next chapters in Mark, you'll see in all the Gospels, this will always be a, conf- like a f- confronting moment for Jesus. Every time, everywhere he goes, he'll have the same thing come up. But he knows that this is the road he will, it will take him to the cross for us. He knew that he has to go this road. It is not the easy road. Because he could have just said, hey, everybody come up here. Come on, I'll heal him real quick. Take some selfies, sign autographs, high fives on the way out. Everybody is cheering and laughing, right? He could have done that. But he didn't take the easy road. He didn't take the easy road for us. Because he knew he had to go all the way to that cross and die for our sins so we could be back in relationship with Jesus. Jesus' life is an invitation to follow after him. It's not just to get healed alone. It's not to get your finances right. It's not just to say the right things. All that stuff is great. But it goes deeper than that. And I'll tell you one thing right now. If you follow after Jesus, it's not the easiest road. It's not. And I know that sometimes we think if we get right with Jesus, all of our problems disappear, and it's a beautiful pony life. I don't know, that's the wrong saying again. <laughs> I messed up again. You don't know what I'm saying. I think it might be a German thing, you know? What's it, what's it called, really? No, it's nothing? Okay, it's nothing. Oh, it's not even a saying in German. Thank you, Jess. No, but it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be the easiest way. But it is the most rewarding one. Because in the end, we will spend eternity with him in heaven. But also, we will get to be agents of hope along the way. We get to usher in heaven here on earth one step at a time. As we follow him on this narrow path. The hard road. I don't know if you've ever heard about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa before, but as I was doing research, it just, it was heartbreaking, it was wild, and I want to share with you because I've thought about our world and how God came for us, but basically, after the apartheid was abolished, in South Africa's first uh, government co- coalition was tasked with stirring the country, right? They just seen horrific things done a racial divide that was never seen before, played out in front of everybody. And the the new government said, hey, we're gonna take an unfamiliar path. They said, they they chose to pursue forgiveness over prosecution and reparations over retaliation. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, chair of the committee, proposed that the TRC, which is that committee, adopt a threefold approach. The first one was, being confession with those responsible for human rights abuses, fully disclosing their activities to everybody. So they would build a room and the perpetrator could come in and share everything, all the bad things he's done in front of the victims and the victims' kids that are not there anymore or their family members. The second step was being forgiveness in the form of legal amnesty from prosecution. They got legal amnesty for that. All they had to come is show up and tell the truth. And then they couldn't be prosecuted anymore. And the last part was restitution with the perpetrators making amends to their victims. This was never done before. And to this day, it's still debated, highly debated if this is successful or effective or the right thing to do. Because it was never done before. Desmond Tutu says in the process, there can be no future unless there is peace. There can be no peace unless there is reconciliation. And this reminded me of our fallen world and our, how far we were away from God. We were so far divided. It's like in South Africa, if you have to picture it, the whole country is in turmoil. But even worse, the whole world was separated from God. And there couldn't be no peace unless there couldn't be the future unless there was peace and there could be no peace without reconciliation. Now this is the language of mercy. 
Mercy is not getting what we deserve. This is why Jesus came for us. There was no future for us because we were at war with God by our actions, our words, and our sin and our flesh. So Jesus came so we could have mercy. We deserved a criminal's death, but Jesus came to reconcile us with God through his death. He offered us a threefold approach as well, to confess our sins. We can confess our sins to him. And then we receive unmerited amnesty for all our wrongdoings. We don't deserve to be here like this. We don't deserve to be close to God. But by an unmerited amnesty, God's saying, don't worry about it, I forgive it all. You can come back home to me. And we can do nothing for it. It's a gift given for us. And the last part is now we get to be part of God's plan to offer this good news to the people around us. N.T. Wright says, it, and this is awesome, it, Jesus' people have to be for the world what, what, what he, Jesus, was for Israel. We have to find ways of bringing healing and forgiveness to our communities. It can be done. And then it's referenced in the TRC. Think of the TRC in South Africa. But, this is the important part, it is enormously costly, enormously costly, and people will oppose it. This is not how people think. This is not how people operate. If we become more like Jesus, we will step on that narrow path and we'll have people oppose it. But we know that Jesus is with us. Jesus didn't take the easy road. He suffered. He faced tribulations. But he took heart, and this is the Bible verse for us, take heart, be encouraged because he has overcome it all. Now we get to be the bridge for others to come to God. We get to be part of the bringing forgiveness and healing to our communities, to your community, wherever you're at, your neighborhood, your work, your family, where you live, all those areas, we get to be agents of hope. But maybe right now there's a person that comes to mind, and if you're honest, you've been kind of taking the easy road with them, you know? <laughs> you like, in a somehow a way, you kind of know, like, you're supposed to be around this cat, or you're supposed to be in this person's life, but you've been kind of avoiding them a little bit, you know, taking the easy road. But maybe it's time to get, to get after it, to reach out, to start discipling that person, to be discipled by that person. I don't know what that is for you, but maybe it's time to do that. Maybe at this church, you've been attending and all, you know, you've been curious about this thing or faith in general, but maybe it's time to get desperate, to get involved. Maybe it's time to sacrifice some of your time to start serving somewhere so somebody else can truly experience God. And they don't have to worry about the kids being back that crazy because you got it covered. Maybe it's time for us all to look at our life and assess, are we on the narrow path with Jesus or are we on the easy road? And I want to encourage you to get back with Jesus. He's asking today to come back and join his task. Point one was when we're desperate, we do anything to encounter Jesus. Point two Jesus will heal us far deeper than even our deepest desires and desperations. And point three, Jesus does not take the easy road for you and me. But the last verse says, I told you we'll come back to that. Mark 2, 12. This amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like that. I don't know about you, but it excites me. Do you want to see something you've never seen before? Can we as a church, I would love to have us a moment where we say, man, we've never seen anything like this because Jesus is here. And there's a saying that says, if you want to see something you've never seen before, you have to do something you've never done before, right? If you do the same thing over and over and expect different results, you know what that is, right? But if you want to see something you've never seen before, it's, maybe it's time to do something you've never done before. Maybe it's responding to a prayer or maybe it's getting prayer in the back or whatever it might be for you. It could be the smallest task. But as you know in your heart, I want to see something different. I want to start praying with my family every, I don't know, breakfast. Whatever, you pick. But if you want to see something you've never seen before, you've got to do something you've never done before. Now as we wrap up, I want to do a little bit of an imagination exercise with you guys. You don't have to close your eyes, but it might help you. I'll let you be the judge. But I want you to place yourself in that moment in time. Let's say for a second you live in Capernaum that day. And you've been hearing the chatter. 
you've been hearing people saying, man, this guy's coming to town. He's, he's coming back. I think he's at so-and-so's house. And you got up early and you told yourself, well, maybe I'll check it out for myself. Maybe you're a little curious. You heard the rumblings about it. So you start walking up to that house and you know he's at. And as you get closer and closer, like more and more people are around you, suddenly it's a whole crowd going to this one house. And you get there and the house is already getting packed. It's getting more and more packed, but somehow you sneak in. You sneak in with the last person, you're in the back sitting somewhere far back and you see it all happen. You hear this man teaching about this new kingdom where the first will be last, the last will be first. And he's saying all these things and it makes sense. He's referencing the old scriptures and there's a feeling about it that is different. And suddenly you look up and there's some cracks in the ceiling. Some of the clay and the little branches are getting moved out of the way. And suddenly there's a whole hole in the roof. And you see, you know, you're like, oh, this is crazy. What's happening here? Right? Because you don't know what's going to happen. Then this man gets lowered down that you remember seeing on the gate every day you walk into work or to the market or wherever you go. And you see him and he is being delivered from his sins. This guy is getting after the teachers that nobody can touch normally. And then he heals the man in front of your eyes. The room is amazed. You know, some start cheering, saying they've never seen anything like that before. Now others start calling him a liar, a teacher that went too far. They're walking out with their heads shaking like, nah, that's too much. He done said he was God. That ain't right. And they're walking off like that. But let's for a second imagine that Jesus is turning his head and looks right at you. And he's saying, I'm here for you too. I'm ready to forgive your sins too. What do you want to do? He wants to restore your health and forgive your sins. He's waiting for you to not be just curious about him, but to be desperate enough to be in a relationship with him. <coughs> for some of you, it might that you've never accepted him as your savior. You maybe have always been on the edge, looking in, but maybe it's time to get desperate enough to say, hey, I'm going to give this a shot. I want to have him as my savior. You can do that today. Some of you guys, it might have more, co- more courage to be a friend that brings others to his presence. That you might, man, these guys out there on the roof, they brought this man all the way in front of Jesus. I want to become more like them. I need to have more courage. Some of you, it might be that you have hardened hearts towards Jesus. Maybe you come on Sundays, you know, you're here, you're checking it out, but it's not for you. Maybe you're not fully feeling it. And if you're really honest, maybe you're even plotting against Jesus. Like, yeah, I can't wait for this to fail. But Jesus is here for you too. And he's saying, I'm ready. Whenever you are, I will forgive you your sins. I will walk alongside with you. And I want you to come home and be part of my family. And again, the beautiful thing about Jesus, not just he wants to save you from eternal life in hell. He wants to walk alongside you today for your tomorrow, for your work, for your school, for whatever you have going on. He wants to see his kingdom break out in your life today. So as we enter into response time, we always ask you two questions. First one is, God, what are you saying to me? And we take some time and, and, and reflect before we start our worship song fully. And this is the time for you to think, okay, God, what are you, what are you talking to me? What are you trying to tell me? And then the second step is, what do you want me to do about it? Because we don't want you just to sit there and think about it, but also take a step. 